Hey guys, let me tell you about a little secret weapon that's making waves in the bedrooms across the globe. It's called Bathmate, and let me tell you, it is not your average gym workout. Now, Bathmate isn't just some hocus pocus magic pump. It's the only FDA regulated hydro pump on the market, making the real MVP of penis pumps. And right now, Bathmate is offering our listeners 10% off of their first order when you go to bathmatedirect.com slash holly. With a 60-day money-back guarantee, you've got nothing to lose except for, well, lackluster erections. So get ready to pump it up and bring your A-game with Bathmate. That's B-A-T-H-M-A-T-E direct.com slash holly to get 10% off of your first order. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered, the show that changes your mind about what you think porn is and the people in it. Um, today, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors before we start. Of course, Blue Chew has been sponsoring this podcast for a long time, and I appreciate you guys. Um, they are a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in a chewable tablet and at a fraction of the costs. You can try it for free if you use my code holly at bluechew.com. All right, so my guest today caused a national scandal when she became the first Israeli woman to start an OnlyFans. She's gone on to have an extremely successful career and become a penthouse pet of the month. Welcome, Mia Ventura. Thank you. How I'm are you? I'm excited to be here. Yeah? Yes. Well, we're excited to have you here. Thank you. So um, I like to, you know, kind of start from the beginning generally with my guests. Um, but let's stop. Let's talk about you growing up in Israel because um, you have like kind of a different background than a lot of my guests that I have on. So tell me a little bit about that. Did you grow up in a religious family? Super religious. Yeah. Like Orthodox, which is kind of like the equivalent to being a Mormon here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, boarding school, woman only. Um, you're not allowed to talk to men or touch men. Even when you're a teenager, you cannot have a boyfriend. You study the Bible every day. You dress up very covered. Um, you pray to God three times a day and you read the Bible every day. Um, on Saturdays, you don't touch any electronics. You don't drive. So you do all the Judaism, 100% of it, fully. <laughs> That's how I grew up. So generally, I mean, do you consider your childhood happy? Like, were you okay growing up in that kind of strict religious family? Or um, were you already feeling a little bit, like, chomping at the bit a little bit to get out of there? That's a great question. Honestly, um, as a child, you don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where you're used to. And you think that that's normal. I think cutting into like 12, 14 teenage years, going into middle school, high school, I started realizing that I really don't feel belong. Um, I wanted to be different. Um, I started exploring online different countries. And I wanted to go to summer camp in the US, went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I kind of wanted to to be elsewhere. So I didn't really feel belong as a teenage. Do not get me wrong, I love my family, I love my friends, um, I love the country, but I do not belong there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so then you went on to um, be in the IDF, right? Yes. Can, and that's mandatory, I believe. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So you turn 18, um, women do two years of service. They serve two years and men serve three years. Um, it's mandatory. You cannot choose unless you have any disabilities mentally or if you're even disabled in your legs. So you can still do office jobs, but if you're fully healthy, you have to go. They give you a gun. I had an M16. It's a very long gun and you kind of wear it like this on your shoulder. Um, every day you have to wake up in the morning and clean it. And the commander comes when there is like every morning they make sure that your bed is organized and they do all the kind of like I would say the daily tasks that you have to do. Um, they come, they lick their pinky and they check that your weapon is clean. And if not, you have to do 20 push-ups, and you're being kind of like punished to obey. That's basic training. 
Um, basic training is also six months of sleeping in tents with 20 women. <laughs> um, very challenging because we all get our periods together. It's very contagious, a lot of hormones. Um, and we don't really go back home to see our families besides once a month. So you kind of do laundry in the sink with like dish soap. <laughs> it's very challenging. Um, and as an 18 year old, um, I was a baby. I was a kid turning into a woman that was like real quick because mm -hmm. you have to feed yourself, uh, learn how to you survive in certain like survival methods that you didn't know exist in you. And um, the conditions are very hard. But after you finish basic training, it's pretty fun. Um, they put me in the Air Force and I was a fitness trainer in the commander unit uh, for the Air Force. They specialized into helicopters and they're all paramedics in the field. So they go into the battlefield and when they have people that are injured, they carry them and they treat them in the helicopter into the hospital. So that was really fun. Um, I was in charge of all the, um, you know, the two years of the people that came into my unit. I was their fitness trainer. I was in a really good shape. I had crazy abs and I was running and doing lifting weights all day. Um, I don't look like that anymore because I <laughs> like be looking more feminine right now. But um, mentally, it's very, it matured me a hundred, a million percent. Like I became... Um, very independent and I think that thanks to the IDF and thanks to the military I had the courage to move to the United States by myself with no money um, I had like $200 in my pocket when I moved here I had a visa I didn't have a green card I was just an immigrant and I think that the only reason why I had such courage to move to a new country was the military service it made me who I am I was gonna ask you if you think that that was a good experience and something that is a positive thing for young people to experience experience before they go into the workforce? I wouldn't call it positive experience for young people because war is not fun. Mm -hmm. And it's very traumatizing to live in a country where there is constant war. And, you know, politically, the Middle Eastern um, conflict is not going to be solved anytime soon. Mm -hmm. It's really active right now as we speak. So yeah. um, it is positive as, um, as an individual. It's very, the tools that you receive as a, as an IDF soldier, as any soldier, I'm sure even in the US military are very, very, um, you know, challenging, but when you accept them and you actually become what they want you to become, which is a soldier, um, you get the tools that no school or college or class would ever give you. Yeah. So that's the positive thing. Yeah. Did you, you didn't actually go into battle, did you? Um, yeah, we had an active war in 2015 and I was right on the Gaza Strip and I was watching the border and every four hours you have to switch with other people in your unit. Um, you can't fall asleep. You have to stare at the same area the whole time. So I wasn't a warrior myself. I wasn't in combat. But when there is active war, they put you in a different position because there's no time for a fitness trainer to be at the gym doing push-ups while you need to be actively, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of watching the border. So I was actually doing that too, which was very hard. You're technically mentally exhausted yeah. because you have to sleep and then go back for four hours, sleep, go back. And the food is not as good during the war because there's no time to cook. So you mm -hmm. eat kind of like tuna cans and mm -hmm. beans and mm -hmm. kind of nasty. But again, I'm really grateful as when it was happening to me during that time, I hated my life, hated myself. I felt like a prisoner. I was like, I can't wait to move to a different country and beat the hell out of here. Sorry for <laughs> my language, but um, now looking backwards, you know, it's been six years almost since I've finished my service. I'm so grateful. Like, honestly, like now everything that happens to me, especially in that industry, which is not easy. A lot of photographers are not easy to deal with, especially mm -hmm. male photographers. I kind of treat it as like, you know, chips. Like, it's just like easy for me. Now, mm -hmm. if something like challenging happens to me, I'm very like, I take it very easy. I'm very chill compared to my girlfriends that are just Americans and I love them, mm -hmm. but they are very dramatic mm -hmm. and they break a nail and they start crying. And I'm like, I've been through so much worse. So yeah. whatever happens, I kind of embrace it and I kind of look at solutions instead of crying over it. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said for going through like those trials and tribulations that are really difficult that really set you up to be able to cope with life's problems in general, like later on. Um, it's never fun in the time um, when you're having, you're dealing with something that's like traumatic or really challenging or really difficult, but it does, if you can get through it, it does set you up 
to be able to manage life better. I've definitely seen that. And I try to remind myself of that when I'm going through a challenging time. I'm like, as much as this sucks right now, like, I will be grateful for this experience later on down the road because I will see like the things that it taught me, the things that it made me grateful for. So it's like always trying to see things with like a silver lining. So I, I can totally relate to that. Oh yeah. So how did um, moving to the US, how was that? Wow, um, moving to the US was the best decision I've ever made in my life. I love this country. I love living here. I love the freedom. I love the American dream. I love the possibility of making money. Um, I don't think that any other country offers the possibility of the the possibilities the United States offers. I find everyone to be super nice to me. Um, five years ago, I could not speak English mm. at all. Like it was horrible. Like <laughs> um, Nick taught me a lot, but not just Nick. A lot of um, girlfriends I met before I even started doing OnlyFans, I asked them several questions like, how do you say this? I showed them pictures on Google, like I had to write things in Hebrew. How do you say this vegetable? How mm -hmm. do you say this? And everyone were so helpful. People here are very acceptable to um, foreigns and strangers and immigrants, especially in like cities like New York, where I just moved to mm -hmm. when I moved to this country. I was in New York first and then I moved to LA. So those two big coastal cities are full of people that are used to newbies. Mm -hmm. um, I just I'm so grateful to be here. It's everything. It's like you, especially in California, you can go skiing and then the day after you're at the beach and you can shop organic or you can go to In-N-Out. It's just, it's an amazing country. I just love it here. It's so funny because, you know, recently I had a guest on Liz Ferrari, who's Rwandan, um, who grew up in South Africa and like same thing, you know? So it's really nice to hear from people who didn't grow up in the United States. Cause I think a lot of times we take like what we have for granted and like, look, it's not perfect. Like, of course we all know that. Um, but it's nice to be reminded that like you You're are lucky. very of your privilege, really, you know, you're privileged to be upset about other things that are wrong with our country, you know, whereas yeah. in other countries, like some people are just dealing with like constant war, you know what I mean? And just like really horrific situation so it's it's nice to be reminded of like the gratitude that we should have for this i try all the time to remind my friends every time they complain about the politics or the current president i'm like hey you're here you could be in south america right now or like in i don't know anywhere else that there is war mm -hmm. or afghanistan or who else god mm -hmm. knows what so or sudan which i wouldn't want to be a woman right now in iran or places like this mm -hmm. so we're very lucky to be strong woman independent woman especially in that industry in such a free country i don't think that other countries would allow women to do porn and be so independent and make money and most of the women in that industry in our adult sex workers industry make more money than men which is i find it amazing i'm yeah. so proud of myself that i make more money than my men you know yeah <laughs> like, it's the one place where like the glass ceiling is reversed yeah yeah and i love it yeah no it's 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 definitely like a good thing so you lost your virginity uh kind of later than a lot of other girls that i talked to right? yeah yeah. Tell which, me a little bit about that. Um, okay. So growing up, um, the community that I grew up in, it's not allowed to have sex before marriage. Um, and you have to actually be fully married before the first time you have intercourse or any touch, any physical touch with your husband. So, any physical touch whatsoever. Yeah, you can't even, you can't even hold. So touch. like no. you haven't like hugged a guy outside of your family before this? Before my first boyfriend that I met in the military. Wow. Nope. nope. It's, um... It's very strict and it's a lot of rules of you will go to hell and your soul will go to the devil if you don't do what God wants you to do, which is mm -hmm. keeping your body to your husband. <laughs> are the rules kind of the same for men as they are for women? Um, it's mostly towards women because mm -hmm. we get our periods. So um, my community, again, I I come from the most um, strict community of Judaism, like Orthodox. There is reforms mm -hmm. and there is conservatives. I came from a really religious family. So there is a lot of more open-minded Jewish people. My dad was not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Um, it, 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 you can't even touch your partner before he, you have a wedding ring and mm -hmm. you're like, you did all the ceremony with the rabbi. Mm -hmm. So I was really horny and I was kind of masturbating in my room, but I couldn't really do anything about it. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, I met my first boyfriend in the military. 
I like nerdy white boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he was the technician. Um, and I didn't, I, there were so many hot guys in my unit, the warriors with the big muscles, the abs that wanted me. And I liked the nerdy guys that was doing the computer stuff. Mm-hmm. I just thought he was so cute. Like he was so smart and I like smart boys. I'm, so. I'm the same, by the way. <laughs> I'm probably like into the, I like the, the nerdy skinny. smart guys. Yeah, yeah. I just think smart boys are so cute and the nerdier they look, the better. So I was, had a crush on him and he didn't want me at the beginning, but um, of, of course, eventually I got him, but of course you did. <laughs> we get what we want. <laughs> um, we started dating for about, I would say almost a year and we didn't even kiss like nine months. And I'm like, so horny and I couldn't do anything about it. And he could, could not do anything about it. Cause now you're my... living in Israel at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah right before I moved here. Okay. Um, and we didn't really do anything about it because we were scared of our families or the community, what people would say. Um, and then one day I just, I <laughs> kind of begged him to just, let's just do it. I can't wait anymore. And I was the one who initiated our first time. Um, it was the, the feelings, the thoughts, the, the shame fault. Like you feel so ashamed that you've done something wrong. Mm-hmm. So, it was it was really hard on both of us and that's what made us technically break up mm-hmm. because we started feeling like oh my god what if our parents find out what if they know what if somebody speaks about it like we we did something that god didn't want us to do um so that set us apart our parents found out and it was not fun for both of us and we went our separate ways and i moved to the us <laughs> wow okay so you lost your virginity to this guy yeah so my first love <laughs> so i mean is that considered like are you damaged goods then as a yeah. potential wife and like no one wants to marry you then yeah unless you lie and you say you're a virgin which a lot of girls do they right lie so i mean did that put you in a position where your parents were like okay well now no man is gonna marry you or were you thinking like we're gonna lie about it? Or were you just like, look, I'm getting out of this fucking country, I don't care. My dad um, wanted me to do a surgery to sew my cherry back up. To sew your hymen back on? Yeah, Can you do you. that? Yeah, they do it in communities like that. No way. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. I know, it's outrageous. Uh, they do it in a lot of Muslim communities as well, where I'm from, in the Muslim villages. So they have a lot of surgeons that actually operate that surgery. And there is a lot of, um, I don't know if I can say it, but I have to, because you have to understand there is a lot of couples that do anal. Uh-huh. So when, after they get married, there is blood on the sheets. So they, she was a virgin, but right. she's done anal many times with her boyfriend before. Yeah. So it's like, kind of like you only do stuff for the community. You don't even live for yourself, which is, I find it very, very hard to live yeah. life like that. And there are so many Orthodox Jews in not even, I'm not even talking about Jewish people. I'm talking about a lot of communities in like Muslim communities or like Mormon communities, like really strict religious communities yeah. where you don't live your life the way you want to live them. You mm-hmm. live your life the way the community wants you to live it. The rabbi yeah. or the, I don't know, the, the church or whoever tells you what to do. And it's very, very hard to live like that. It's a lot of stress and it's a lot of pretending to be someone you're not and Mm -hmm. shutting down your own wants and beliefs. And it's horrible. Yeah. I grew up in an atheist family (laughs) with parents who did porn. So very, very different, like very different experiences, (laughs) uh, you and I. (laughs) I saw your mom at X-Biz. She's such a fun woman. (laughs) She's crazy. She's awesome. Yeah, she's she's a funny lady, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) oh god so um okay so now when you moved to the u.s like how did your family take that okay so i have two parents my mom and my dad they got divorced when i was three Mm -hmm. my mom is very open-minded she's a very accepting woman um the reason why she divorced my father is because she didn't want to be part of that as well he's the one who tried to make her so you know religious Mm -hmm. and she wanted to live her life my mom and i are best friends um, we talk every day. She knows what I do for a living and she knows I'm on OnlyFans and she knows I'm pretty famous. Um, when I went to visit her last time, we walked in Tel Aviv port and people were asking me for selfies and signatures. That's how famous I am there. At least 10 people stopped me in 10 minutes into walking, like to get coffee with her. Hey, it's me, Aventura. Can I get a signature? Can I get something? Like people were just asking me for a selfie. So my mom accepts it. She knows it. She's not obsessed with it. She thinks I'm smarter than this because, mm-hmm. you know, 
she's still in that mind mm -hmm. and she wants me to do something else with the money that I save which I understand it's understandable she thinks that the industry is not for older women which I disagree with there is a lot of beautiful MILFs on OnlyFans I was gonna say actually like the MILFs are like the Doing biggest it. I think it's like the biggest category actually and like the biggest growing it. like and it wasn't always like that that's actually a more recent phenomenon I think more since the internet came along but when I started um, working in the adult industry like MILFs were not a thing and now it's like the the biggest like the biggest niche oh yeah so i would say you could literally like work in porn for like forever if you wanted to <laughs> i watch nick strokes every day he works with um mark with atmla mm -hmm. and all they book him is for milfs every day yeah every scene milfs and he loves that yeah and yeah. you know i love milfs myself most of my only fans scenes are with women and mm -hmm. I film with beautiful 40, 50 year olds that look like they're in their 30s. Mm -hmm. And I look up to them. They inspire me. I'm like, I want to have your boobs. I want to have your face. I want to have whatever it is that you're doing. Give me your doctor right now. And also, <laughs> like, I mean, they're so, they've been in the industry, usually, not all of them have been in the industry for a while, but like, you know, they have a life experience where um, they really like have it together, you know, and they tend to be very organized and they know exactly what they want. They're good at setting boundaries. So there's like a lot of things I think you can learn from them for sure. I love shooting OnlyFans content with them. It's always by the list. I will tag you on time. They always edit it on time. Mm -hmm. They post it, they shout out you. Well, when I work with 20 year olds, which I of course love too, but I need to remind them, hey, don't forget to tag our videos. Don't forget yeah. to post them. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I love working with more mature woman a because they're hot but b also mostly because it's very professional yeah was um only fans the first place that you were ever like with a woman like had you thought about being with women before that I've had a um, few threesomes with my boyfriend um, before we opened only fans we went on tinder as a couple mm -hmm. and I I knew I started exploring my sexuality when I moved to the US mm -hmm. I was very horny I, I don't know if I can say the word I you apologize. can say any word you want okay I was very curious and I wanted to try out things that I've never tried. So when you come to, it's kind of like you go to the mall and you have like endless possibilities for shopping. That's mm -hmm. how I felt when I moved here. <laughs> Everyone is available to want to sexually involve with me if yeah. they're like me. And yeah. it's not like that where in Jerusalem where I'm from. So I'm like, oh my God, there's so many beautiful girls and I think I'm bi, I don't know yet. Let me test it out. First time I kissed a girl, it was phenomenal. It was like such soft lips and it's so, she has such good smell and she kissed me much better than my own boyfriend did. So mm -hmm. I was like, I think I really like women. And um, I, I'm definitely bi. I like both genders, but I love the sensuality of being with a female. Mm -hmm. So I guess that this is my first time trying to do all of this was exactly five years ago when I moved here. And ever since then, even before OnlyFans, um, we started in threesomes and stuff. And then some of the girls kind of liked me more sometimes. So I kind of met up with them alone. And Nick was very open-minded about it. He's like, do whatever you want, which was very surprising because where I'm from, men control their woman. Mm -hmm. And then my man here in the U.S., he's super open-minded. He lets me do what I want. You can go here. You can travel there. Most of the times I do stuff without him and he completely trusts me. We're super open-minded and super open relationship. We're not monogamous. And it's just so healthy in my opinion. It's such a healthy relationship. We never fight. And I think that that's the main reason why I love being with women because... I don't know, the, the trying it the first time in such an older age made me even like it more because now I appreciate being with a female. I'm like, mm -hmm. I know it's wrong where I'm from, but here it's so beautiful and so fun and so sexy. Yeah. I was going to ask you, so that shame that you experienced that first time that you lost your virginity with your boyfriend at the time, um, how did that affect you once you moved to the US and you start like sexually experimenting and maybe even now? like? Do you still like feel that tug of shame? Wow. Um, I feel that tug of shame when I visit my hometown again because everyone saw me naked on camera, like going down on women and mm -hmm. showering with people and, you know, having full sex on camera on my OnlyFans. So um, that's where I feel shameful. But here, especially in cities like LA, Miami, or Vegas, where I go to the most and where I get booked the most by photographers, um, as a freelancer model, of course, I don't feel weird about it and I don't feel ashamed about it. So it mm -hmm. depends where you put me in. If you put me in like Indianapolis or Kentucky, I don't think I would put an OnlyFans tank top when I go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But here in LA, I go to Malibu and I see girls like doing TikToks with their stuff out, like just promoting their stuff. So 
I think it really depends of where I am at, like at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really like about the societal stigma and whether or not like you're feeling that at that time. It's not even about how you feel about it personally. Yeah. And that's like a thing that I argue about a lot with people because, you know, there's a lot of people that say like the porn industry ruins you and it causes all these mental health problems and stuff like that. And I think that you come into the industry, look, you can come into the industry with mental health issues and it can exacerbate it for sure, depending on your situation. For some people it's helpful, it's different for everyone, but I would say the most damaging thing about porn, honestly, is the stigma that you experience from it. Like if you try to leave the porn industry and get a different job, a lot of people have issues with that, um, banking discrimination, um, all kinds of problems. And that's all more about how people see you because you are important, not necessarily how you personally feel about it. So yeah. it's interesting that you say that. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like the first year I saw OnlyFans, it was during COVID, it was 2020. I was really ashamed of it. I didn't want to talk about it in public. I didn't want people to know. It was very like, it just food fetish. I didn't even show my face on OnlyFans the first mm -hmm. half of the year. And I was making good money just showing my feet. Um, but then- it's so funny because <laughs> there is this like belief that like anyone can make money off their feet on OnlyFans. And, like, <laughs> I'm there's, proof. You know, but it's like, you never hear that. Cause people are like, I don't need to show my face. I can just sell my feet. And I'm I like, did. That people aren't that thirsty that there's this huge like wealth of guys that will like just pay <laughs> for anyone's feet. You know what I mean? Like it's usually a little bit more than that. But I mean, apparently, I do have really pretty toes. <laughs> <laughs> but now um, I feel like <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> now I feel like I'm definitely I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of being so independent to a point where I can own stocks. I can own crypto. I can buy a house. I can buy a car. I can buy jewelry. I don't need to like struggle for money. I can pay my bills on time. I can just, and you know, I started at a very young age. So you just create wealth. And if you treat your money right and invest the right investments from doing OnlyFans, I think it's 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 really respectful job as long as you're not being forced to do anything you don't want. Yeah. That's why every time you do porn before a scene, Nick told me that they asked him, are you uh, sober? Are you doing that? Um, are you agreeing to everything that you do? Is it consensual? So same thing with OnlyFans. Before we start filming, we actually go off camera first, start feeling the vibe and the chemistry. And if somebody doesn't want to use a certain toy or they don't want to do a full vagina shot like when i shot with um the other girl that you mentioned that you uh filmed her the other month she doesn't do you know stuff Corey. like this yes yeah, yeah so we did topless and that's mm -hmm. it and we kissed a little bit we took a shower stuff like this like um i would call it soft core mm -hmm. so you just feel the vibe and i i really find it very respectful like i don't feel like i've ever done something i didn't want to do mm -hmm. and that's the main reason why i didn't go on mainstream because i find only fans very like powerful as a mm -hmm. female like i just decide what i want to do and i do it and it makes me money yeah nobody tells me what to do yeah <laughs> all right we're gonna take a quick commercial break and then when we come back we'll talk about how you got started on OnlyFans. Um, and then uh, I know that you do financial domination. That's always a very interesting topic for me and my listeners. So <laughs> stick around guys, we'll be right back. Hey guys, let me tell you about a little secret weapon that's making waves in the bedrooms across the globe. It's called Bathmate. And let me tell you, it is not your average gym workout. Now, Bathme isn't just some hocus pocus magic pump. It's the only FDA regulated hydro pump on the market, making the real MVP of penis pumps. Each Bathmate is hand assembled and subject to a thorough manual QA process. So if you're ready to join the ranks of satisfied men and their even happier partners, dive into the Bathmate experience. And right now, Bathmate is offering our listeners 10% off of their first order when you go to bathmatedirect.com slash holly. With a 60-day money-back guarantee, you've got nothing to lose except for, well, lackluster erections. So get ready to pump it up and bring your A-game with Bathmate. That's B-A-T-H-M-A-T-E direct.com slash holly to get 10% off of your first order. All right, everybody, we are back. So Mia, when did you actually decide to start an OnlyFans and how did that whole decision come about? Okay, so when I just moved to this country, I was experimenting my sexuality as a flight attendant. I was a flight attendant for a commercial airline for like a year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then COVID hit and they laid me off. So yeah, that's from... definitely an industry that tanked. Yeah. <laughs> so from being a um, commercial flight attendant, which is where I met my first boyfriend in the US and moved to LA from New York and did all the fun stuff um, and just 
I was a regular girl, not an OnlyFans girl, um, and I was still, I still experimented my bisexuality and my sexuality and stuff like this, but it wasn't on camera yet. Um, OnlyFans, uh, not OnlyFans, sorry, COVID hit. And when they laid me off, I kind of started thinking about different ways to make money. It started on Mayhem, another website where photographers book me per hour because... Model Mayhem. Yeah. Wow, I haven't used that site in so long. It still exists? Uh, back then, like oh, okay. four years ago. Okay. <laughs> it started as uh, even Purple Part, like a lot of different websites where you are kind of like going to be a model without an agency yet because mm -hmm. I just started. Plus, I really like owning my own stuff kind of thing. I've had a lot of agencies, a lot of agents contacting me, like Hussy, uh, 101, um, what's what's the name of the other one that wanted me this month? OC Models, they all contact me every month to um, represent me and I would say no. So um, at the end of the day, it was COVID, I got laid off and I kind of thought about what can I do? I had around 50,000 followers on Instagram for being a flight attendant and traveling around the globe and taking pictures in China and Thailand and Europe and Africa Africa, and I posted a lot of pictures in a bikini as well so I started doing modeling for like a hundred bucks an hour something like that and then one time one day this photographer in the middle of the photo shoot tells me we've shot a lot of uh, socks and um, leggings and stockings content he wanted me to do a lot of feet stuff and he paid me very well and he told me you have really pretty toes did you ever think about opening an OnlyFans and I was like what's that <laughs> I was like, what do you want from me? I'm just trying to make money. Can you get, can I get paid and leave? Mm -hmm. I was like, I thought he's trying to sell me something weird. Yeah. Um, it was like really in the middle of COVID, like April, 2020. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, you can just make money taking pictures of your feet. You have really pretty toes. Your toes are beautiful. You have tiny feet. You can start doing it. Just put pretty nail polish and do it. And I was like, you know what? At this point, I live in LA. It's extremely expensive. Why not? I yeah. like my feet anyway. I already post pictures of my bikinis on Instagram for free. Why not try to make money out of my other pictures of mm -hmm. my bikini and my feet? Um, and I did it. I opened OnlyFans um, at the end of April 2020. Again, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life, just like moving to the US. I'm so proud of myself. I've done this decision. I just, it changed my life completely yeah. financially and it just gave me stability and I met great people and girlfriends for lives. And it really made my relationship with Nick much stronger. It was just amazing. So it started with no face, just feet for like half a year. And it was pretty decent income for just feet. Yeah. And then I realized, wait, if I make this amount of money for just showing my feet, what can I make out of showing my boobs or showing mm -hmm. my face and show who I am? Which was a huge um, break. It was a huge deal in Israel when they found out who I am, that I'm Israeli. It went all over the newspapers, all over the news, all over the media. I was actually on the global news, like the-, the <laughs> What are like, I'm just like, what are the headlines? Like Israeli girl joins OnlyFans? It doesn't yeah. seem like that's- She's starting to do, she moved to the US and now she's a porn star. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the porn star name, get, the porn star gets clicks. Yeah, a lot of, uh, it said in Hebrew that now I'm a porn star. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and that's before I even started doing sexual stuff. It was just a bunch of topless and bikini and feet and you know like teasing softcore taking my thongs off in the shower when it's really dark stuff like sensual stuff like yeah. boudoir stuff mm -hmm. um, but for them it was like big uh, sensation that's mm -hmm. the word I was looking for it was a huge sensation in Israel I found out myself all over the internet and like one day became from having 50,000 followers on Instagram to 250,000 followers in like mm -hmm. two weeks. And they're all from there, like back then in 2020, my Instagram went from getting like 10,000 views on a story to like 80,000 viewers on my stories. Like insane, like the, the, the engagement got crazy. Comments were mean. A lot of reports, my Instagram was shutting down every week because the community there did not like what I do. Did you get a spike in your OnlyFans subscriptions? <laughs> did I get one? Did you get a spike in your OnlyFans subscriptions? Yes. <laughs> so was it worth it? <laughs> it's just funny, you know what I mean? It's like all these people that like go on your free platform and yell at you, but then like, do they also <laughs> join your OnlyFans too? You know what I mean? To see who you are. Well, I mean, people are hypocritical. They are. So how did you feel when you when those headlines started coming out? Um, the only thing I cared about was my family, honestly, yeah. at the beginning. Um, it was everyone. It was my first boyfriend contacting me, telling me that I'm lost and I need help. And if I need to go to rehab, if I'm on drugs, 
um, if I'm, I need any help, if they should call the police and get me out of where I'm at. Um, it was my dad texting me the worst text ever. It was almost my birthday that month when it got huge. And he was like, you're the biggest disappointment ever. I never want you to be my daughter. I don't want to talk to you ever again. Oh my gosh. Um, it's my girlfriends from high school that are now married with kids and they're my age. They're all like, this is disgusting. I don't want you to be next to my kids and family. Um, to my mom that was like, you know what? Are you happy? Are you healthy? Are you sober? No one is taking advantage of you. Don't care about what people think. Are you happy? That's what my mom told me when I called her crying that this is huge and I'm all over the news and I want to I wanna hide in a basement for like two years till I'm no longer part of the big news there. Mm -hmm. um, and she made me realize that if I wake up in the morning and I feel good about myself, I don't care what it shows on the media. It could show a lot of other things. Last week I went viral on uh, influencers on the wild in the wild it's like a instagram oh i know that instagram account that thing's hilarious i was with my slave uh just bought a twelve thousand dollar chanel bag and we were taking pictures with the chanel uh bag in front of the chanel logo and the comments are like this girl looks like she has a sheen bag not a chanel she's so trashy those girls are taking uses of men they take advantage of them i feel bad for this woman she looks so ugly she looks so old and i'm like i'm so used to those comments yeah. where i'm like okay you're just dying to do what i do maybe or maybe they don't you know maybe they just don't agree with my lifestyle which is acceptable but why being so mean on talkbacks like why do you have to write all the negative stuff just yeah. don't comment people but, like mm -hmm. i mean people tend to view everybody else through the lens of their own experience <laughs> i think that's like the biggest problem like people see so like someone doing what you do and they think i could never do that so therefore I would be very unhappy doing that. So therefore, yeah. she must be very unhappy doing that because I can't imagine that somebody else in the world would think differently, would see things differently than me and have a different experience. And that's just like, I think that's where like a lot of people kind of fall short. And that's something that I've learned in my, my many years on this planet. It's just like <laughs> recognizing that like we're all different. We've all been like, we're a mix of our, like how we've grown up, the um, like literally our genetic makeup, like so many different things. and different things are different for different people. And you don't really get to say like whether or not someone's doing what's right for them, you know, just cause it's not right for you. And it's just that projection, which I think is really unhealthy. Yeah. But also too, I mean, what I'm talking about right now, you know, when I, earlier I mentioned about the social stigma, that's like really damaging. I mean, like all those things that those people are saying to you. It's horrible. Like that's really awful. Comments and that can evil. be really, and if you're not tough and you don't have thick skin, like that can be really hurtful and damaging. Oh yeah. You know, um, so, I mean, I just, I personally, like, I never read the comments. I try not to. I used to cry and now I'm just like, okay, I look at their profile sometimes to see who they are. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like middle-aged women that just got divorced and they mm -hmm. have kids that like, I don't know, they post pictures of their cats and I'm like, they, they call me names, they call me fat, they call me ugly, old. Um, they called me um, taking advantage of innocent men, user. I don't even know so many names. And I'm like, this man wanted to gift me mm -hmm. that gift. And if not me, he would do it with another yeah. Domina, so yeah. Dominatrix. So I didn't force him to do anything. I didn't have to have sex with him for that. I'm not forced to do anything. And some of the comments are like, oh, she has to spread her legs right after. I'm like, nope did not <laughs> yeah so and again and even if you do you should, yeah. if, you, if you want to why not yeah. like it's your life it's your body if i want to have sex with multiple you know partners which i have girlfriends on porn industry that have done game bangs and they loved it and they had fun yeah so as long as you're a mature adult person and you do what you want to be doing and you're comfortable doing it so why judging you know it's just yeah. you, you can see it as an example of how i grew up with my community you know so i could have been like one of those people and judge but i chose to get out of this bubble and live my life mm -hmm. which is very mentally like refreshing yeah um i feel so much better than i felt as a child as a teenager that i felt so like secluded and i felt so i really felt like a prisoner in my own house every day yeah yeah i felt like i'm pretending to put a mask on every morning and now i feel so free like i can put a costume on and do a cosplay and I still film myself so again um, when it got super viral last week the video of me with my slave shopping in Rodeo Drive I tried not to read the comments but sometimes I read them just to remind myself that okay there was people like this out there maybe mm -hmm. I should be careful not always being super open-minded because I am very open-minded yeah so I try it is hard How, do you have a relationship with your father at all now? no no I don't think I spoke to him in a few years now yeah. I'm sorry. Do you hope that that will resolve itself someday? 
we're so far apart at this yeah. point. Like, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen my pictures of penthouse, and that made him super mad. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's fixable at this point. Maybe one day uh, he wants me to. For, in his opinion, when I turned 24 last year, he texted me that I should have had three kids by now. So in that community where he's from, you have to have like eight kids and you have to be a housewife and you have to get pregnant every year. That's why my mom had every year she had a child. So um, when I'm 26, my brother's 25, my brother is 24. Um, so wow. she was literally pregnant every year. And then she told my father, I don't want to be pregnant anymore. I just want a year break from my body. Yeah. And he's like, no, God wants you to be pregnant every year. That's your job as my wife to get pregnant and Wow. Give me kids. <laughs> talk, I mean, God, talk about, you know, people talk about how you must be trafficked in your situation and you're doing things for your body it's that you don't it. want. And like you hear something like that. Like, I mean, talk about your mom had no agency over her body. Yeah. She didn't get to choose whether or not she, you know, was bearing more children. That was somebody else's decision. Yeah. I mean, that's like. Sounds worse than porn to me. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> a lot of. <laughs> But yeah, um, so in his opinion, I should be a mom to like at least three kids by now and just, you know, serve my husband at home. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I had a kid at 40 and I'm so fucking glad I waited. <laughs> so glad I waited. I'm a much better mom than I would have been at 24. Yeah, for I'm sure. lucky to have any kids right now. So. Yeah, no, you don't even need to think about that. Nope. <laughs> so um, you mentioned the slave. I definitely want to talk about your your work as a dominatrix. Tell us about that. <laughs> My favorite topic. Whew. Um, where can I start? Can you direct me a little bit? Because there's a lot. Okay. To share. So, what even gave you the idea of doing Dom work? Wow. Okay. So, once you start foot fetish, it's kind of the beginning of Dom work. Mm. It's the, so, is that the, uh, the gateway the drug? <laughs> feet. Be careful. All it's those there. people that you can think you can make money up just your feet on OnlyFans, the gateway <laughs> drug to being a Dom. <laughs> having a slave buy you a Chanel bag. <laughs> Not just that. When I started, I was completely innocent. I was actually submissive to my boyfriend in the bedroom, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know what controlling man is. Now, I didn't know how much I like it also. I'm really – I just opened to all of this in the last few years, and I'm so happy I did because it feels so amazing. Um, so when I started Food Fetish, um, it started as very innocent, just trying to pay my bills kind of job. And then I started getting DMs on OnlyFans, which, again, I'm glad I never – took on an OnlyFans agency. I have so many agencies that contact me on Instagram. They're like, we're I just gonna too. take 10% of your I do bag. too, oh my God, every fucking day. Every day, every they day. come out of nowhere, like yeah. from Canada, from Africa, from Everywhere. India, from blah. And I'm like, I always did my own OnlyFans. I treat it as an online boyfriend. Before I go to bed at night, I take myself the couple hours of answering those 120 DMs or so. It takes a little while. You go on your iPad, laptop, phone, whatever. And you do it and it's hard and it's a lot of work, but I don't want an agency controlling my source of income because I have a lot of slaves that I met on OnlyFans and, you know, it's not allowed to meet them on OnlyFans and take them to private. So I can't really say how they found me probably on Instagram, most of them, mm -hmm. but they started as subscribers and they became full time, you know, supporters. So the way it started is that I got some DMs and I did my own DMs. So. I didn't really know how to reply to some of those. It was like, I'll pay you whatever you want for your use socks. I'll pay whatever you want for your, um, a cup of your pee. Um, I would love to have a picture of your armpit before you shave it. It's like stuff that are like fetishes that I didn't really know exist because I thought that most men just like boobs or ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, um, yeah. a lot of armpits. Big spectrum out there. Yeah. Kinks. Yeah. A lot of, um, I had people that want me to take a picture of me um, pooping. Um, a lot of stuff that are Sorry, crazy. You, you reminded me of somebody who wrote me a very eloquent email asking uh, for my toilet treats or a scat caviar, as he called it. <laughs> I miss that guy. He used to write to me like once a year. Like, did you change your mind yet? I'm like, I sure didn't. That's crazy. Yeah, it was. So you get me. It was a very well written email. I have to say, it's the most well written email I've gotten asking for my poop. You should do a highlight on your story with all the weird requests. So funny. Oh God, I got. Yeah. Thousands. I got, uh, I, got, I got a whole folder in my email inbox. We'll put it that way. <laughs> I feel the same way with my OnlyFans. <sighs> so at the beginning, I was like, okay, I have a business-oriented mind. So I kind of was like, okay, it's a possibility to do those crazy videos and charge triple or 5x times what mm -hmm. I make on my feet or 
topless yeah. pictures. So some stuff I said no to. I said, I'm not ready for it yet. And some stuff I said, you know what, whatever. I'll send him a picture of my armpits. Like, yeah. whatever. Who cares? Um, and then it became into people contacting me on Twitter, which is now X, telling me um, Twitter is what really opened me to Dominatrix Life. It's the most open platform. I'm, I have a smaller following on Twitter than Instagram, but most of my followers on Twitter are slaves. So I started um, doing shout outs for shout outs with other Dominatrix. Um, in the industry, a lot of girls from different countries and the slaves just slide into my DM, slid into my DM and they came into my DMs and they were like, I want to do this and that and I want to purchase this and that and I would love to have your phone number and I would love to support you, whatever you need. So every time I get my nails done, hey babe, here's my cash shop. Every time I go on a vacation, babe, those flights cost me money. Every time I want to go shopping, I put my Amazon wish list. It's just like the little things. It could start from like $200 on my Venmo for getting my nails done. And it could go up to, hey, babe, I love you so much. You're my biggest queen. Here is a crazy amount of money for this month's allowance because you're my only queen. And the only thing I want to do is be your slave. And I had one month where I had like five active slaves, full-time slaves, and each and every one of them literally gave me a paycheck that month. So when my um, <laughs> when my CPA saw it, I had to explain to her why <laughs> I got those huge amounts of checks from slaves. And she realized she's really open-minded, thankfully. So and she's a woman, which I love. So. I had to like, well, to this is a tax write-off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. So, yeah, I would call it gift. I mean, seriously, though, if you think about it, like the different kinks that you're fulfilling, like if you're fulfilling foot fetish kinks, like can you not write off all of your socks and your shoes? Yeah. And your pedicures, yeah. right? And your lingerie, lingerie bikinis, yeah, whatever. Travel, I mean, food, yeah. like food. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, at the beginning I felt kind of bad. I was like, I don't want to take his paycheck. I feel so bad. But then I started realizing if I don't take his money, he will go give it to somebody else because that's his fetish. He wants to be financially dominated by a female. That's mm -hmm. his, I don't know what happened to him that made him want to do it. You know, some people like, some people are gay. Some people like, I don't know, big tits. Some people like um, big women. And some people just like being dominated. And it's normal and it should be accepted. And I've never done anything that my slave didn't want me to do. And I only took what they wanted me to accept. So it, you know, from being ashamed of taking people's money for no return, I realized that they actually get a lot of return. Mm -hmm. They get their fantasy to be fulfilled. They do this because they enjoy it. Um, they don't. Um, masturbate or come without my permission. I control everything they do. They don't take on another queen without my permission. Um, and it's becoming from being the little shy girl that barely speaks English and like an immigrant with no money to being dominating like few people at a time. It's just, it's a life changing experience. It's just like now I can travel wherever I want and he will pay for my flight. He will pay for my hotel. He will pay for my shopping. And it's, I never force them to do anything. They just look at my social media. They look where I'm at. And they sometimes even contact me. They're like, oh, I just saw you post the pictures of your sushi. Let me pay you for your dinner. Like they want to do it. I never ever demand anything. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty fun experience for me personally. Um, and sometimes it's not even the money. It's about the fact that they, if I have a bad day and I feel kind of like bloated, I just got my period, I have a breakdown, I got a pimple and I don't feel the prettiest, they would treat me like I'm the most amazing female, I'm their queen, I'm the most beautiful girl ever. And I'm like having this horrible day hating on myself. And I would get this message from my slave telling me, like, I breathe the air that you give me, you're my everything. Like I have screenshots of them telling me, I can't go to sleep without thinking of you. You're my life, you're my everything, you're my, I want to live only when I think about you and I've never even met them those are people from like Canada or like different states in the US I have slaves from the East Coast that I've never met with so and, you know and they come and go they enjoy financial domination so they have few queens at a time and they jump between them they subscribe to different girls and one month they would be fully into me and the other month her and then they would come back to me so mm -hmm. some of them are really loyal to me and they only want me some of them enjoy having different queens and they hop around. So they yeah, I think I, I feel I feel like some of them because I've I've had I'm not like a financial dominatrix by any mean, but I've had a couple of guys ask me to do it, which like is like I'm always like I don't like I'm not a dominating person. I mean, it's funny I kind of am, but not like in a sexual way. I'm like I don't know what to do, and but then it'll be like a couple of days where they want to send me a bunch of money, and then they just poof, just vanish. Yeah, I'm just like. 
Bye bye. But I hear that from a lot of girls who do financial domination is that like they kind of sometimes they come and go. And then it's not that easy because it's like I know so many people who hear that, oh, financial dominatrix. Oh my God. I can like tell people to give me money and they'll just give me money. That sounds so easy and that sounds like something I would love to do. But I've heard that it's actually not as simple and like getting those guys that are really committed to you and, and really like actually want to send you money rather than because some people want to fantasize about sending you money but they don't actually send you the money so what do you think it is about you that like keeps them i'm a really hard worker i'm really organized and they're not really loyal most of them it's a really hard job and a lot of them also that's a really good point you say 70 percent of the inquiries are not serious yeah there are a lot of guys that would be like let me give you all my money let me buy you amazon list i'm like don't even talk to me i became Again, I wasn't dominatrix at all in my sexual life, but I became so used to it after a few years of doing it that I'm like, don't even talk to me before you show me any kind of contribute because mm -hmm. it's a lot of money. Like it's a lot of wasting your time. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't even want to do it. They just want to talk to you for free. Mm -hmm. I'm like, go to my OnlyFans. I'm, I don't have time. So it became, it was a lot of um, kind of like try and see if it works out or not. And now I have my own methods. I have my own list. I have my own copy paste replies. And I have, and I don't mind saying on podcast, I don't mind if they know that they should know that that's where they're at. And I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. And I became so good at it to a point that if I have, let's just say I have five slaves at a time, I would remember to talk to each and every one of them every day because it's a full-time job mm -hmm. and they want attention. They want the good morning. They want the good night. They want the, what did I wear today? What did I eat today? I literally have to communicate with them like a boyfriend, like every freaking day. Yeah. And again, even when you do that, sometimes they vanish because they like doing it with a lot of women and they like their pockets empty. So mm -hmm. again, it's definitely is a lot of work and I'm very motivated for that kind of industry because again, I'm not in mainstream and I'm not a porn star, I'm an OnlyFans girl. And that certain side income sometimes can even make me more income than my OnlyFans. Because mm -hmm. if I have one month where I have really active slaves that are in love with me and obsessed with me, they would sometimes tip me what a hundred subscribers would not tip me at the mm -hmm. same time. So, but again, it's not, uh, OnlyFans and dominatrix and this kind of work is never, it's never just like a regular income from nine to five in an office that you know the paycheck that you're gonna get. Some months you're gonna do insane. And some months you're gonna go back to basic and like kind of like some slaves will clear out and then another month you would have new ones to come in. And it's always about what you post out there and what happens to you. And it's also about kind of luck because there's a lot of queens out there and there a lot of them want money and a lot of them want their nails done, their shopping bought and their I don't know, vacations paid for. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that special, to be honest. But again, I keep it very real. I yeah. always tell them, this is your job. If you don't want to do it, all good. Like, yeah. I'm not going to be your girlfriend. I'm not going to be your wife. We're not getting married. You're technically just my slave. Yeah. And they know that. And I came from not being in that industry at all to becoming a pro into it because I taught myself the tools of how to do it. Like I know after two messages with the guy, if he's going to waste my time or not. And mm. a lot of them do a lot of yeah. them are time. There's all, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like, you have to kind of manage your time because you can spend a lot of time on someone who isn't paying a lot, which sounds like a terrible thing, but it's like when you have so many people writing to you, like you, it's a business. Just like you said, like you have to figure out where you can give the most amount of your time because your time is not infinite and you don't have an agency running your page where there's like a team of like six people who are answering messages at all the time it's all you so like you have to be selective and i think that like i think the best fans understand that you know and then other people who don't well they can go find somebody else who has an agency running their page and I hate There's that because they're talking to it. a guy. They're talking to some dude out there. Yeah. And with me, you need to wait sometimes a couple of days when I travel to get a DM back, sometimes yeah. even three, four, five days. But when they get a reply, it's me. Yeah. And they know it. And the reason why I like keeping it real is because they know that sometimes I would rather you not sending me any money than you just wasting my time. If you don't have the money right now and you don't want to tip me, you just want to watch for free, do it. Good for you. You mm -hmm. can go on X and see stuff you can't see on Instagram. You can go to my free OnlyFans that has a little bit of stuff. But if I rather, sometimes I would rather have a couple guys that are loyal to me and invest in me than having 20 of them that are just yeah. a waste of time. And maybe that's like a hundred bucks here, 50 bucks there, 70 bucks here. Yeah. Do you have like a specific set price um, for 
like various services that fall under financial domination? I used to. I used to have a menu. Mm -hmm. And then I realized with slaves, it's not like that because some mm -hmm. slaves have more money and some slaves want to be really controlled financially. And some slaves want to kind of invest, but not everything they have. Mm -hmm. So I've realized that the menu actually hurt, used to hurt me because I would sell myself for cheaper than what they offer me. Mm -hmm. I had a guy one time that told me to just meet up with me and see me in person. I'm not talking about any sexuality or any nothing. He would give me $8,000. And I was like, what? Like, are you serious? I mean, are you guys having lunch? And or is he just I, like... I didn't know till I started talking to him and realizing. And again, I saw how much he sent me in the, that month of being like, an online slave. Yeah. I realized that this is not a joke. He's serious about it because he sent me almost half of it online already, you mm -hmm. know? So of course he would give me that amount to see me in real life. And um, it was um, a pretty interesting story because he grew up in a really Jewish community as well and he mm. followed me and he loved my story so I think a lot of slaves um, relate to their queen or dominatrix whatever you want to name it because of their life story because of their look her look some of them would like a girl that looks the opposite like mm -hmm like skin color or like hair color and some of them would like someone who that is from the exact same community mm -hmm. so that specific slave grew up um hasidic jew and he was a virgin and he was 42 and he never had sex before he was a full virgin wow. he met me he loved my story he thought i'm so brave and he wanted to just see me like mm -hmm. and you know i went with nick and i felt really safe and uh, i was in new york and it was okay it wasn't scary we met in public um, he was shaking when he saw me. He was so excited, mm -hmm. but he was my my fan. He wasn't like a weirdo. He didn't try to like, but you know, it's really scary because sometimes you could be a serial killer that would try yeah. to like kidnap you and put you in some yeah, you just basement. Don't know. So you gotta, you gotta be careful in that type of industry. That's for sure. So did you guys just like meet in a park? Like, where'd you meet? <laughs> we met in Brooklyn, which is where he's from. He's uh -huh. very religious. Um, we met right next to it wasn't a Starbucks. I think it was a coffee bean. It was like a coffee store. And he was so excited to see me. He wanted me He wanted me to go drink something. So he asked me if I want to grab a drink. And I wanted to like, I kind of pretended myself to be a queen and to be a bitch and be uh -huh. mean to him. So I'm like, yeah, go grab me a drink. Like, I'll wait here with my heels on. I was wearing like all, all latex. Yeah. It was kind of funny to see the situation. He came back with the drink and he was so excited to see me that he was like holding it and it spilled all over the floor in the street. Aww. It was the daylight. It was like 2 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Like in a really, you know, busy area in Brooklyn. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say exactly where because that's where yeah, he's yeah. from. But really religious Jewish area. Um, and again, he wore a hat. He wore sunglasses. And he just left the community. So he already shaved his hair. And he did all the stuff to not make him look super Jewish, but mm -hmm. super Hasidic. But he still spoke Hebrew. We actually spoke in Hebrew most of the time. So there's crazy stories like this of people that are just like your real fans and they would pay any amount of money just to meet up with you. So how long and, did you spend with him? Um, I was with him for like 45 minutes to an hour. And were you just standing there talking or no. did you like guys go get... We, I felt comfortable with him. We got more safe with each other uh -huh. and he offered me to drive me back to my hotel. Uh -huh. The fact that he spoke Hebrew and he's from the same community, I know it sounds stupid of me that I did it, but... I felt really safe. I felt like he's just Nick, a nerdy Nick guy. Nick was with you? Yeah, Nick was with me in New York, but he didn't come to the meeting. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So I came into the car with him. He drove me to my hotel, and the whole ride while he's driving, he was touching my feet, like massaging it, smelling it, sniffing it, licking it. I have it on video. I posted it on my OnlyFans, and OnlyFans took it down because you're not allowed to take a video in public while driving. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. why I have Fansly now because I have a lot of pee content when I pee on stuff because they love it and OnlyFans doesn't allow pee. No, they don't. So I kind of hate them for that because yeah. it's annoying me because Here. I need it. So. Guys, if you want the pee content, you got to go to Fansly. I'm there. Just or loyal fans. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the pee stuff on loyal fans and Fansly. But yeah, wow. so he drove me back to my hotel back from Brooklyn all the way to Upper West Side Manhattan and it was really safe. He just sniffed my feet the whole drive and he paid me that crazy amount of money. Wow. Do you still talk to him? I still talk to him here and there. Yeah. yeah. Did he, he did it kind of drop off a little bit after that meeting? Do you think it was yeah. like a crescendo for yeah, him? He just and, wanted to see me. Yeah. He just wanted to meet me. I thought he was gonna be a regular slave. I was really disappointed. Mm. I'm sure he's gonna he follows me so much that I'm sure he will see his this podcast. Mm -hmm. But I think that he didn't have that amount of money to give me every month. He just really wanted to see me at one yeah. time and smell me. Like <laughs> smell my feet. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he sniffed it. Like I have that video. It's literally on my phone, on my <laughs> you know, on my folder with all of my other videos. He 
took my feet let's just say that's the feet and he like like cocaine like I've, i have that video when i posted it the comments i got are insane it got viral like he was so obsessed with my feet i've never seen someone so obsessed with something so before. he basically like, paid eight thousand dollars to smell your feet smell my feet see me touch me um look at me in person see me with no filters no photoshop just touch me <laughs> see me wow. crazy yeah Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so my last question for you is actually from one of my Patreon members, Michael, um, mm -hmm. and he wants to know if you will ever do studio porn. That's a really good question, Michael. Um, for the right amount of money and with the right partners and with the right director and the right camera people, I would rather it be mostly females on, on set. Um, I would definitely consider because I'm, every year since I've started, I became much more open-minded. So right now I'm still at the point where, oh my God, I don't want my name out there for free on Pornhub because it will maybe affect my OnlyFans income. But I might change my mind because I didn't know three years ago that I'm gonna be a dominatrix. I thought that this is crazy and now I do it. So right now I'm in a point where I'm like, oh, I don't know about mainstream, but then this year I went to XBiz and AVN and I met so many beautiful girls and I collabed with them for OnlyFans and they look pretty happy. Even though people say that porn stars are sad and it's a horrible industry, most of the girls I've met are mentally stable. They're happy, they're doing good. I'm not saying all of them, some of them, you know, they need to smoke a lot of weed and stuff like this because <laughs> that's where they are. They like being stoners. But um, most of the girls I met are happy where they're at. They're yeah. happy to move to LA. They're happy to be in the industry. So I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not going to say no and I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to say probably and I'm going to say maybe. Okay. <laughs> You're going to think about it. Yeah. I think that's a good answer. If it's all females on set, I'll do it like tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mia, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure. Um, really interesting story. And um, yeah, it was just so nice to meet you. Thank you. So excited. Thank you for having me. I've been following you for a very long time and I love your work. I think you're such a hard worker. Uh, you're so motivated and I look up to you. You inspire me and I think that you're beautiful and I love the browser stuff you posted today. <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here and hopefully this will <laughs> go well. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, I think people are going to be really fascinated by this interview. Thank Yay. you so much. Thank you. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Yes. So I'm mostly on Instagram because of modeling. The real Mia 55. My main platform is definitely OnlyFans, but if you want fetish stuff, is definitely Fensley and Loyal Fans. My handle on Instagram is the real Mia 55, and my handle on X and Twitter and the rest of the stuff is Mia 55. Why? Because there is a lot of Mias out there, and five is my lucky number. <laughs> Good reason. And you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Holly Randall if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews streamed live. They're mostly streamed live, except for today because our internet still isn't fucking working <laughs> um go to patreon.com slash holly randall unfiltered uh go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my socials and thank you guys so much for watching see you next week thanks for having me Bye.